Near field RF probes or sniffer probes such as these can be extremely valuable to help you locate sources of emissions from a circuit board or a product that you're developing. But in order to make the most efficient use of these uh, probes and to understand the results that you get from them, it's important to understand the differences between the different types of probes and the differences between the measurements that you make in the near field versus measurements observed in the far field. So that's what we're going to cover in today's video. These near field probes can be broken down into two basic types. These are the E field probes or electric field probes and these are the H field or magnetic field probes. So let's take a look at what each of them does. The E field probes respond primarily to electric fields. Electric fields are produced by voltage changes in a circuit. They typically look like a stub antenna or sometimes like a small little ball at the end of the wand. And they're really insensitive to the orientation in terms of how the probe is brought up towards the device under test. Now the H field probes pr respond primarily to magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are produced by current changes in a circuit as opposed to voltage changes. They often look like a loop and they're shielded to minimize the E field pickup, so the sensitivity to an E field, so they respond primarily just to the magnetic field changes. Now what's really important with these E field probes is that they are sensitive to the orientation in which you apply them to the circuit under test. They only respond to current that is in the same plane as the loop. So if the loop is kind of flat here, any current flowing in this plane would be fine. But if I turn the loop this way, it would only be current flowing in this plane that would respond to the loop. Current flowing, say, in this direction, which would be perpendicular to the plane of the loop, uh, would not get a response out of this field. And this could be very handy to help you identify a particular circuit trace that might be uh, ra radiating uh, a magnetic field. And we'll go take a look at that. Now in a pinch, if you don't have uh, any kind of probes, you can go make yourself a little unshielded loop uh, like this and sniff around your board with that. That's going to be sensitive to both uh, E field and H fields, and it might be a little harder to interpret some of the results. Uh, but in a pinch, it certainly would work fine. That's important to note that regardless of which type of probe you're using, um, they are typically designed to pick up radiated energy or fields, so they're not designed to be electrically connected to your circuit. So they're oftentimes dipped in some kind of an insulator so that uh, if you happen to touch your circuit board, you don't uh, short the probe to any node on your board. Now the E-field probe, like we said, is responding to voltage changes on the board. You can see uh, most likely an oscillator here at 48 megahertz that's being picked up uh, on this chip over here. Uh, there's another harmonic of it up over here. Um, and uh, they're really useful uh, primarily around logic circuits and things like that where the interconnections are not very long. You might have large voltage swings without a lot of current swing. Uh, so you might create a large electric field uh, in those types of situations. Uh, if you've got uh, a lot of changing current flowing through a power supply, um, a voltage probe isn't going to see that or a E-field probe isn't going to see that because there's generally not much of a voltage fluctuation in the power supply, but the amount of current that's flowing in that power supply trace might vary quite considerably. And that's where one situation where a magnetic field probe or H-field probe might be more appropriate. You'll also notice as I'm probing around here, the response of that probe is not a function of orientation of the probe. We can see that the response isn't changing much uh, if I rotate the probe around. You can see the response is basically about the same. And that's a characteristic of the E-field probes as well. Now with the H-field probe, we're looking for magnetic fields, which are responding or being created by changes in current. Now what you'll find generally is that uh, as frequencies go up, uh, the impedances that are involved in the board go down. You might have controlled impedance traces and things like that, which generally means the currents involved are a little bit higher. So I found that um, the e field, uh, H field probes are generally more effective in locating sources of higher frequency emission than um, the E field probes are. You'll notice that I'm pr holding the probe so that the plane of the loop is parallel to the plane of the circuit board so that any currents in the circuit board are going to be coupled efficiently into this probe. Now as we did mention that uh, if there are currents that are perpendicular to the plane of uh, the loop 
they wouldn't uh, get responded by the loop. And let me show you an example of, uh, of what we can do with that. Now over on this edge of the circuit board here, uh, we've got a high speed current trace. There's actually a cutout of the board that was designed to allow a current probe to be clamped around here to measure that current. But we can also use this to illustrate uh, the orientation sensitivity that I was talking about with the H-field probes. If we take and put the plane of the probe parallel to the current flow, I can easily see the broadband emission on that trace. But if I now rotate this probe 90 degrees uh, with respect to that current flow, we can actually see I can make that signal completely disappear. I'm still sitting right on top of that same trace, but by simply rotating the probe 90 degrees, we can get a, a lot of sensitivity to that current or make it completely go away. Now this can be really handy when you go to search for an offending emission on a circuit board. So for example, what you would often do is take the H-field probe in parallel with the board and scan around looking for the area of the board that is uh, creating the offending emission. Once you've found that, then you can orient the probe vertically so that you can align the plane of the probe to particular traces of the board to see which traces might be carrying that current that are creating that emission. Now many times you might have a very dense board and you can't narrow it down to a particular trace. What you can then do is switch to a smaller diameter H-field probe. This will be less sensitive but it'll allow you to kind of get, you know, dis distinguish between two traces that are close together to see which one is carrying that offending current that's creating the offending emission. An important thing to be aware of is that the measurements made with near-field probes may or may not match up with measurements made with an antenna in what's called the far field, typically done in like EMI compliance measurements. And the reason has to do with the wave impedance. Uh, all other electromagnetic waves uh, consist of both a magnetic field and an electric field. And the ratio of the strength of those two fields is called the wave impedance. And just like in Ohm's law, it's the voltage or E field divided by the current or H field. So in the far field, in free space, that relationship is 377 ohms. That's effectively the impedance of free space. However, when you get closer and closer to the circuit itself, uh, the wave impedance is more dictated by the circuit impedance, whether that field is created primarily by a large current change or a large voltage change. So as we get closer and closer to the circuit under test, the E field or the H field might be stronger. And as you get further and further away from the device under test, those fields will change at different rates as we, we get further from the device until they converge at this 377 ohm relationship in the far field. So when you're making measurements in the near field, if you had, say, a voltage source, maybe it was two logic chips sitting next to each other, you know, swinging five volts back and forth between them, but with very little current, that might be a relatively large voltage change with very little current. That would give me a large E field, but very little H field. Uh, on the other hand, you might have, a say, a power supply trace that's going to a bunch of circuits. The power supply trace might have, uh, you know, uh, a very, very little voltage change on it, but the current changes through it, depending on the load, could be quite significant. Now, in that case, we're going to have a lot of high-speed current variation, but very little voltage variation. So, in that case, the magnetic field, or H field, would be quite high, and the E field would be quite low. But in both cases, those fields will ultimately converge out into the far field. Now, in, you know, as I said, mo most high-speed emissions are going to be dealing with you know, a lot of current changes, uh, and generally lower impedances, so I find that the H-field probes are a bit more effective in trying to help identify sources of these high-frequency emissions. Um, so I would you know, kind of concentrate using that first, but you certainly have got some value in looking at both the E-field and the H-fields. Most references that you look up when talking about near-field and far-field will kind of quote this value, uh, the signal's wavelength divided by 2 pi, or about 15% of the wavelength as right about the transition point from where uh, the wave impedance will transition from being controlled or dominated by the circuit impedance to being the 377 ohms that you see in the far field. Now it's often a good idea to search with both E field and H field probes in the near field because especially if you don't know the source of the emission.
Uh, if you had a, a high-speed current in a power supply line that was creating a strong uh, magnetic field, if you had only searched around with an E-field probe, you wouldn't have seen that. And there's other situations like that as well. So it's always a good idea to use both if you're searching for the source of an offending emission. I hope you learned a little something about the differences between uh, the different types of near-field sniffer probes, the uh, E-field probe and the H-field probe what each of them responds to, and how you might use them to help locate a source of offending emissions, and how the measurements made in the near field might relate to measurements that are made in the far field with an antenna. Thanks again for watching. Comments are always welcome. and I will try to put some references to uh, near field probing and things like that in my show notes below, along with a PDF copy of the notes that I showed in this video. If you like what you see, give me a nice big thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.